Otworf? Here. Council Member Story? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Peterson? Here. Thank you. Uh, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, allegiance the, flag to the flag of the United, of the United, States, of United America, States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, liberty, justice for all. Justice for all. all right. All right. Uh, in accordance with the current shelter in place order from Santa Cruz County Health Service and Executive Order N2920 from the Executive Department of the State of California, this council meeting is not physically open to the public. As you can see, we have limited council members and staff physically present in the council chambers during this meeting. The rest of the council has called in to participate remotely. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from the city's website, cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Benjamin Thompson. Thank you for being here, Benjamin. Despite being physically closed to the public, participation is still possible. Public comment can be emailed to the council for their attention during tonight's meeting. Please identify the item you wish to comment on in your email subject line. Emailed comments will be accepted starting now up until I announce that public comment for an item is closed. Each emailed comment will be read aloud for up to three minutes or displayed on a screen. Emails can be sent to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Emails received at that email address outside of the comment period outlined will not be included in the record. Lastly, we want to thank you for your patience tonight as we adapt to this different way of conducting council meetings for the safety of everyone involved. We're gonna move forward. Are there any additional materials? No. Thank you. Uh, any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes. Great. Uh, we'll move on to item four, public comment. Now is the time for members of the public to address the city council on any items not on tonight's agenda. Uh, let's wait a minute here and see if we have any public comment come in via email. Doesn't look like we do. All right. No public comment, then we will close the public comment uh, section of tonight's agenda and move on to city council and staff comments. Uh, let's start with council member Vertron. Do you have any comments? Uh, none at this time. Thank you. Council member Botorf, any comments? I have no comments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council member Story? No comment. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks? I have none. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say uh, briefly that if there are any members of the public that are in need of assistance, um, there are still many community organizations that are available uh, to assist. Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, Community Bridges has their community resource centers open, as well as Meal on Wheels is still operating. Um, please do reach out to your community if you are in need because there are community resources available to you. I'm gonna move on now to the uh, consent calendar. All the items on the consent, oh, I'm sorry, are there any staff comments? Almost skipped over staff there. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I think the only thing I would note is, is for those of you who tuned in last week or two weeks ago for this council meeting, we we're using the same format. There's very few staff in the room here this evening. We do have our department heads um, are available to answer any questions should they come up. They've logged into the Zoom call, so. I think Great. that's it and everything else I'll have in the presentations. Great, thank you. Uh, any further staff comment? No? Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to our consent calendar then. Items listed in the consent agenda will be enacted in one motion. Um, is there any, uh, uh, excuse me, any council questions on the consent calendar? I have a comment about um, item A, the minutes from the February 27th meeting. Just a comment? Um, well, yeah, our uh, requested um, 
change or correction. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and vote on the remainder of the consent calendar first. Uh, let me bring it first to public comment. Is there any member of the public that would wish to pull an item from the consent? Or any emails come in saying as such? I don't see anything. Okay, uh, with that, let's, uh, we'll entertain a motion to approve the remainder of the consent calendars, uh, agenda item six, B and C, and then we'll come back, um, council member story to item A for, for the consideration of the change. Motion move the one approved. Second. I think I heard uh, Botorf and seconded by Bertrand, okay. Uh, all in favor, uh, let's do a roll call vote. My apologies, I keep forgetting we're not here to do that kind of vote. No problem. Let's do a roll call, please. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Botorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to return to item 6A on the consent calendar. Council Member Story, you said you had a, a requested um, change? Yes, uh, Mayor. Thank you. On um, item D, um, and it's at the page, top of page 9 um, in the packet, uh, there's a sentence that says Council Member Story would like the city to purchase the carousel. Um, and my recollection was that um, I wasn't, um, I had reservations. Uh, about um, purchasing the carousel uh, since we had no stated uh, purpose for it. Um, and I think I expressed that and, and that statement seems to be um, fairly unambiguous that I wanted the city to purchase the carousel and I don't recall that um, uh, reflecting back on the meeting. Council member story, I, I was not present at that meeting but I will double check and take what you just said and I will amend the minutes appropriately. Yes, thank you. I think if you go back and just check the video. No problem. Um, there was, yeah. Great. So that's, the, that's the only uh, change that uh, I uh, had. Okay. okay. Are there any uh, further comments on consent calendar uh, item 6A? If not, we'll uh, entertain a motion to approve item 6 of, or 6A of the consent calendar. Also moved with, with the amendment. With the amendment, yes. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Botorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move along to item seven, general government public hearings, and we'll begin with 7A, an update on the COVID-19 emergency declaration. All right. I think I have to do this in the proper order here. Can't stop video, share screen, share screen. I think we're having some technical difficulties with our screen here in the- Yeah, it's just taking me a moment. Okay. Everything has to happen in the right order here. Great. Okay. Mayor, Council, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the mask off just to make sure that it's everyone can understand me because I know that it can be challenging given everyone's different technological devices that they're using. Um, this is the second update we've done on the COVID-19 um, situation. I want to talk a little bit about first the regional, um, the regional update. Then I want to talk a little bit about the city attorney. We'll talk about what the state's doing, and then we'll focus in on what's happening here at the city. Uh, as everyone's aware, we have the shelter in place order that was originally issued um, by Santa Cruz County Health Officer. It's now been extended through May 3rd. Um, just this week, we also had orders from the health officer recommending wearing facial coverings, cloth facial coverings, when people are out of their homes. In addition, we had a relatively dramatic order this week that came through that closed all beaches and parks within the entire county through next week. This was done in anticipation of some of the potential crowds that could be coming to our community over the Easter holiday. 
uh, and the Santa Cruz County Public Schools will remain closed through this through this year. Um, I wanted to share with you some data, some stats. I think everyone knows that I'm a bit of a data freak, so I will try to keep it relatively short. But this is a summary of sort of a regional status. This is information that can be found on the county's website, which is a great source of information. They did a recent update to the website, much more user-friendly format with a lot of data. They show that the total number of known cases in the county is 80, 13 of which were required hospitalization. That is not the number of people that are currently in the hospital. I believe that number is currently about half that figure. And it breaks the cases down by age and known gender, as well as underlying conditions. Also on that page shows the number of new cases over time. And I think this is one of the data points that I think is helpful. If you can see my mouse right now, I'm showing, this is showing the number of case, the positive tests that we've had over time. And you can see that we have not had a spike that the, normally when you look at these sorts of curves, they show this sort of dramatic exponential growth. We've seen a relatively flat curve, which really goes to show the work that this community has done in terms of social distancing and trying to do its part to slow the spread of the virus. This is some other information that I presented at the last meeting and I thought I'd share an update on it. This is from a website, Unicast, and they're pulling um, data from people's cell phones that show how much they're traveling. And then they give a score for every county in the state as well as all the states in the country. California as a whole is getting a B right now. It looks like Santa Cruz County, we're at a B plus. Um, a lot of the coastal communities are doing pretty well. Interestingly, it's the first time that I've seen that the Bay Area counties weren't leading the way. What this chart on the bottom shows is over time, the sort of average amount of time that these phones traveled and how far. And it shows that starting right around May 13th, 14th, that we started to see a drop in travel and all the way down to where we are today, where that figure is hovering around minus 50 to 60% of the normal travel. And then in addition, you can see up here are the number of new cases in the state. And again, it's a similar um, pattern, maybe not as a, a dramatic as, as in our county, but you can see that with a typical exponential curve, you'd expect to see this number way up here by now, and we haven't been seeing that, and the number of cases has not spiked in recent days. Another data point I wanted to share is this is cumulative cases by county throughout the state. This is from the LA Times, and it shows all of the different counties and the different curves this is going back to when they first had their 20th case and then how many cases they've had cumulatively over time. A steeper a curve, the more vertical it is, the worse a community is doing because it means the cases are doubling more qu quickly. A flatter curve is better. It shows that the cases are growing much slower. Um, one of the good pieces of news is here, as you can see, Santa Cruz County. And Santa Cruz County is actually on the lower end of the trajectory for all the counties in the state and shows that it has a doubling time at this point of approximately once every two weeks. And again, I think that's a testament to the work that our community has done to try to really observe the new rules um, and the health orders issued by the health officer. Next, I'll turn over to uh, Samantha Zutler, the city attorney, and she's prepared to give a little bit of an update on what's been happening at a statewide level uh, on the crisis. Sam? Thanks, Jamie. Um, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, it feels like every day is a year in some ways. And so it feels like things have moved so quickly. But one thing I just realized is we have not met since the governor issued his executive order on March 27th, it seems like a year and a half ago, um, it, prohibiting evictions. And he, he did that the night after, or the day after the evening in which we the city of Capitola adopted an urgency ordinance prohibiting commercial and residential evictions. Um, and his order was a little different. His order prohibited, it extended the deadline in which a tenant who is served with an eviction lawsuit has to respond to that lawsuit for 60 days. And so the effect of that was essentially to prohibit just residential evictions for 60 days. Um, so that happened on March 27th. Then on two, three day, it was Monday of this week, the Judicial Council issued 
a set of 11 emergency rules. And one of those emergency rules is, I think, the most dramatic um, action on evictions we have seen to date. And that emergency rule it was the first emergency rule. The effect of it is to essentially prohibit evictions from, 90, from now until 90 days after the governor's stay-at-home order is lifted. And that judicial rule applies to residential and commercial evictions. Um, the governor's order and the city of Capitola's ordinance require that the, to take advantage of the protections that the eviction be related to an uh, inability to pay due to medical expenses or COVID-19. The um, rule by the Judicial Council does not include such a limitation. So the only limitation is that the only evictions that are permitted to go forward are those that are required for health and safety reasons, for the protection of health and safety reasons. No other evictions, residential or commercial, are permitted, permitted to go forward from the date the Judicial Council issued the rules, which I think is, it was April 6th, to 90 days after the governor's stay-at-home order is lifted. Um, the Judicial Council, one of their rules also applied the same restrictions to foreclosures. Um, so those were issued on April 6th. Also on just recently, the governor, the governor's office has issued a flurry of orders. Um, one of the most interesting, I think, was issued on earlier this week. It was April 3rd, and it um, prohibited price gouging. There's already a statute on the books in the penal code that prohibits price gouging after an emergency declaration is issued by the state, the feds, or a city. And that statute already says that um, certain businesses cannot, including hotels, for instance, and businesses that provide uh, supplies that are necessary to deal with the emergency cannot raise their prices by more than 10% within 30 days after the emergency declaration is issued. That's, um, that regulation, that or statute has been on the books for a long time. A lot of cities relied on that or even um, strengthened that after the recent fires. What the governor did here was strengthen that prohibition. He extended the protection date to September 4th of 2020. He also broadened it to include all consumer goods. The price on consumer goods cannot be 10% higher than the highest price on February 4th, 2020, unless, there are, unless it's for a specific reason enumerated in the order. So that's my update. There's a lot going on, but I think that's the highlight. All right, Sam, thank you. So now, very quickly, I'm going to focus on what we've been doing at a city, as a city uh, to respond to this. Um, the first item, and this is going to be, this is an action for the council to consider taking this, this evening, is uh, I believe it was late last week, um, I issued an order basically to try to help avert some of the issues that we saw potentially coming um, with crowds coming to our beach. And so what we did was we closed the upper and lower beach parking lots. Um, the intent behind that was to make sure that we didn't, you know, those lots are very large and they're intended to accommodate uh, a high, high level of traffic of people coming and visiting our beach, which at this time is, isn't appropriate. In addition, we reduced all parking in the village to one hour from three hours. We also banned large shade structures, that's tents and pop-ups from the beach. The intent behind that was, again, just with our very limited sand area that we were concerned that the shade structures can effectively take up so much room that they end up really um, impacting um, social distancing protocols. So that is, there's a resolution on for this evening and a recommendation to approve, to sort of ratify these orders that we've made. We've also been working very hard on a special edition newsletter for the community. Um, this would just be a print version of some of the information that's contained in these presentations and also found online to try to get out to our community for folks who maybe don't have great internet access. We've been working with the county um, to provide some disaster service workers to help outside the city um, with the food distribution networks as well as call centers, some of the shelters. So our staff has been stepping up and helping, helping out there. 
And again, on the HR side, there's been so many changes with the federal rules around um, leave that we've been working to implement those changes as well. The police department is, continues to respond for calls for service. Uh, our officers are wearing personal protective equipment when interacting with the public. Uh, our lobby does remain open. It's one of the few city facilities that is open to the public with social distancing restrictions that apply. The police department has also formed a COVID operations team that began operations today. Really the intent behind that is to get out on foot, bike, motorcycle, to help offer sort of a visible compliance team to help make sure that people are complying with the social distancing requirements. Public Works has been very focused recently, especially on the closure and barricades for the beach and park, given the health, direct, uh, health officer's orders to close these things. We've also continued our cleanings of our um, existing facilities. There's several projects that are going, uh, ongoing construction projects, as well as two projects that are going out to bid right now. And they're continuing to process uh, encroachment permit applications for development projects as they, as they come forward. At this point, the only publicly open facility on this list uh, is the police department. Everything else, as you recall, that the list was more balanced last time, but with the closure to the parks and beaches and the restrooms that are located in the parks, um, at this point, these facilities are closed. I will note that the, the par parks and beach and the Esplanade restrooms, we will be uh, obviously looking out for the potential new rule or what the changes would be after April 15th um, should they come into effect. Finance department, they're working remotely at this point. Um, we're doing weekly accounts payable check processing and we're really focused on revenue and cash flow projections for the remainder of this fiscal year and next year because uh, as we talked about last time, the fiscal implications uh, of this are gonna be very significant for the city and so we're developing models and, and alternatives for the city to to consider future meetings, um, what actions we can take to help avert, um, avert the worst of the impacts. Planning division, they held a planning commission meeting last week, fully remote, similar process as what we're doing this evening. They received some public comment by email and uh, by all reports, it went well. Building division is continuing to, oh, one of the important things that came out in the updated shelter in place ordinance was the number of construction projects that were allowed to proceed was significantly pared back. So we've developed a list of all the uh, active essential construction projects that are taking place at this time. Uh, the building inspector is doing proactive patrols to make sure other projects aren't taking place and the police department has been made aware of the list and so that they know which projects are supposed to be um, being worked on at this time and which ones are not. Recreation division, um, pretty interesting uh, program that Nikki was able to launch this week with an online public recreation program. They had 85 class participants who've signed up for the first four week series. A lot of positive feedback about the program. And we are also looking very hard at our summer programs about what we think we may be able to offer this summer, particularly for the youth. Um, we will need about five weeks to sort of get it up and running. As I mentioned previously, we have held at this point the junior guard registration um, and we will we'll be revisiting that and taking a look and seeing when we may, may or may not be able to open that up. So the recommendation for this evening is by a supermajority vote to make a determination that the hazards related to the pandemic still exist. At number two, the second rec recommendation is to adopt the resolution in your packet that ratifies the emergency orders that would limit parking in the village, continue to limit parking in the village to one hour, closing the upper and uh, lower beach parking lots to public um, and banning the large shade structures on the beach. And with that, I'm available for questions. Great, thank you. Um, let's go down the line for questions from council. Uh, council Member Batorf, any questions? I have no que questions, Mayor. Uh, council Member Bertrand, questions? Uh, not at this time, thank you. Council Member Story. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Jimmy, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is concerning the uh, parking pay stations. Um, I was wondering, are we taking any action to, um, you know, uh, wipe them down, um, you know, during the course of the day? Um, and if not, I mean, do we have signage uh, letting people know that there are all alternatives that they could use? Uh, are recommending that, you know, they use them with gloves. Oh. Hold on, sorry about that. 
Um, so that it was just, you know, about um, the public's use of the parking uh, pay station was my first question. Um, my second question is concerning and trying to be optimistic and looking, looking at uh, moving uh, beyond um, the shelter in place uh, orders. Um, has there been any discussions or thoughts about um, how we guide the public in transitioning out to um, maybe uh, you know, more uh, community contact um, and doing it in a thoughtful and um, I think more measured way? Or are we just going to, you know, like open the doors and tell everybody to have at it? Um, so those are my two questions and I'll go on mute and take them offline. Okay, great. I think the first question, uh, Chief McManus can help us out with the pay stations and what we're doing with them. Good evening, Mayor Peterson and Council Members. With regard to the pay stations, uh, the short answer, Council Member story is yes, we are wiping those down, cleaning those as best we can, monitoring the usage of the stations given some of the parking restrictions. And we've been able to do that by increasing the uh, number of hours one of our parking service officers is able to both repair, maintain, and keep those stations properly cleansed as best we can. In addition, in, yeah, addition, thank I, you, Chief. in addition, I think we've also developed some additional signage that lets folks know that they can pay by phone. Have Correct. we been able to implement that? We have been able to. Uh, we Each of the stations has the signage for the um, mobile app. Um, Park Mobile. Park Mobile is a technical name. We've added additional signage throughout the Village Esplanade area to try and uh, encourage um, uh, the public to use that app. Uh, that way they can prevent touching the machines at all. Uh, we haven't looked at the numbers yet. Uh, Sergeant Evans is uh, following up on that, doing some research. We think that we have incre increased participation in the Park Mobile app, um, and we might be able to produce a number at a later date, but I don't have that number currently. Great. Thank you, Chief McManus. So the other question was about how does this, how is this going to get unrolled? You know, how are we going to move from where we are today in a shelter in place back to the next step? And that has actually been an area of some uh, quite a bit of discussion that I've had with the other city managers as well as the county executive officer. Um, at the end of the day, one of the one of the realities of the situation, which is is very it's interesting to live through, is is that the position of public health officer during a pandemic is probably one of the most powerful um, public sector positions somebody can have. Um, there's a huge amount of authority vested in the public health officer during a pandemic, and and they can make determinations which practically would never be possible in regular times. For example, closing all the beaches in the county. So in the conversations that we've had internally, we've talked about what do the next steps look like. And I don't think anybody has, has a silver bullet at this point, but I can tell you that all the conversations are um, focused on a stepwise approach that what really would need to happen is is that there would be some iterative lifting of some of the restrictions at times so that maybe the list of essential businesses would expand for example or the allowed types of construction activity could change and and doing it in a stepwise fashion and continuing to monitor the data to understand what that's doing to the um the growth curves of the virus so I don't have an answer to how it's going to work. I can tell you that the conversations are taking place. And at the end of the day, it'll be up to the health officer to issue those orders and then us to help at a city level to help communicate with our community and enforce those orders um, as we move forward. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and I would just ask if you know, maybe you could keep us informed as these discussions evolve and conclusions are drawn finally about um, how we're going to start to move away from uh, the shelter at home. But thank you. I can do that. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks, any questions? I do, thank you. Um, I have three questions about your um, the presentation itself, um, city manager. The first question is, um, if you can just go back and uh, let me know what the data site that you we're using um, with all of the graphs. I, I think you mentioned it, but I missed that. Um, secondly, how many staff of ours actually 
are being used or um, working with the county? Have, has anyone actually moved over to, to support the county? And then the last question is about the comments. Um, at the bottom of your slide, it says to comment on this uh, email, the public comment. And is that something that's new? And are we, um, are the city council members receiving those comments as well? And those are my three questions. Thank you. Okay. So the first question, um, so we're going to go back and look at the, the data. So this slide and this slide come directly from the Santa Cruz County uh, Health Department's page on COVID-19. This page comes from Unicast, and the way I always find it is by typing in Google, and you can see the URL at the bottom of the page. I just Google that term at the bottom, social distancing scoreboard, and it pops up. This, these data are from the LA Times, and the URL is at the bottom of the page, and it's just a, a tracking site that they have that shows sort of how the different counties are faring in terms of cumulative number of cases. The next piece of your question was how many of our employees are currently serving as disaster service workers? And my understanding is it's three right now. And then the last part of your question was, please remind me, I'm sorry. About the public comment. <laughs> oh, the public comment. Yes, so the public comment, when we get to that, when we get to the end of the questions, I will put up on the screen any public comment that we do receive and we'll read it. Um, We'll read it into the record as well as display it on the screen so you can see it. Thank you. So that's the email for for council meetings themselves, not up all of the time, or is that available for folks to email anything? So that's that's intended to be for public comment during the meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, if there's no further council questions. Uh, we will bring it to public comment. Okay. So we'll see that email address in action here while we wait to see if anyone has emailed us with public comment on this item. And it doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like we did. All right. Uh, seeing none, we'll close public comment for that item and bring it back to the council for uh, further discussion and a vote. Uh, let's start with um, Council Member Story. Do you have any additional uh, discussion? Uh, I have no additional discussions, and I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Botorf, any additional discussion? Uh, no additional comments, and I'll second that motion. Okay. We have a, a motion by Council Member Story, a second by Council Member Botorf. Council Member Bertrand, any additional uh, comments? Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, the city staff and Jamie in particular being uh, aggressive on the actions that we're supporting here. Great. Vice Mayor Brooks? I have none, thank you. All right. Uh, with that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we do a roll call vote? Council Member Bertrand? Aye. Council Member Botorv? Aye. Council Member Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we're going to move on to item 7B, a report from the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission on an approved Measure D amendment and Highway 1 projects. So this item is, is um, on the agenda at the request of Council Member Bertrand, who's our RTC representative. And I believe we have Guy Preston on the line. And Guy, if you're ready, I'm prepared to, Guy Preston is the executive director for the RTC, and I'm prepared to staff, uh, to man your, um, your presentation. Just give me your cues. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, good evening, council members, and thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Um, um, this, as uh, Jamie stated, this, uh, this um, presentation was at the, uh, request of um, your council member Bertrand, who I refer to as Commissioner Bertrand, as uh, he serves as one of my 12 commissioners, as does com uh, Commissioner Batorf, who you know as council member Batorf, but um, he is uh, one of 
mice fall commissioners as well, and they represent Capitola very well. Um, um, with that, I uh, think I'm ready for you to advance to the next slide. So I'm here today to talk to you about um, Measure D and um, Measure D um, expenditure plan um, provided for 25% uh, of, of revenue to be allocated to, um, to uh, the highway program. But um, starting from the very beginning, um, November 8th, 2016, uh, the voters of Santa Cruz County approved the Measure D ordinance enacting a retail transaction and use tax dedicated to making transportation improvements. The ordinance includes an expenditure plan and a requirement that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission in its role as the Measure D Authority shall allocate, uh, administer, and oversee the expenditure of all measure revenues which are not directly allocated by formula annually uh, to other agencies through an implementation plan. And I'm ready for the next slide. So the um, expenditure plan outlines the use of measure revenue to, distributed across five investment categories. The investment categories are consistent with the regional transportation plan and improve mobility, promote sustainability, and improve safety regionally. There are five categories. Uh, the neighborhood and street projects um, represent the biggest pot, and that's shown there in Fuchsia um, at 30%. Uh, transit and paratransit receive 20% of revenues. The highway corridor, which we're here to talk about tonight, um, receives 25% of revenue. The rail corridor receives 8%, and the active transportation um, category receives 17%. Next slide. So the as I mentioned earlier, the, the expenditure plan provides 25% of revenues to be allocated to the Highway 1 and Highway 17 corridor, um, and their projects are to increase uh, the safety and efficiency of these corridors in Santa Cruz County. The Highway Corridor Investment category of the expenditure plan states that highway investments included in the expenditure plan improve traffic flow and safety on Highway 1, especially for South County and Mid-County commuters, small businesses, uh, bus riders and first responders um, by adding auxiliary lanes. Um, it also allows for bicycle and pedestrian crossing. Um, the auxiliary lanes are identified as lower cost highway projects that can improve flow by separating, entering and exiting traffic from the through lanes and can help improve the safety on this high traffic volume corridor. Um, we also um, are allowed to use expenditures for travel or information and traffic demand management, which we do primarily through our Cruise 511 program. And the highway quarter investment category also states that programs that reduce fatal injuries, collisions on highways, and reduce congestion are funded by measure of revenue. Next slide. So although Measure D provides significant funding to deliver regional investments identified through the expenditure plan, it was not intended to fully fund all investments. Section nine of the ordinance states that leveraging or matching of outside funding sources is strongly encouraged. When the ordinance was written and adopted by the voters, there was limited and unreliable state and federal funding sources. In 2017, the California State Legislature passed and the governor signed Senate Bill 1, also known as the Road Repair and Accountability Act, and that increased transportation funding by an estimated $52.4 billion over the next 10 years. There are several key competitive grant programs included uh, that RTC plans to target for various different um, uses, including the Active Transportation Program, which um, provides $100 million per year to um, agencies that are successful in uh, securing those grants. Uh, two most important ones for Highway 1 are the next two, and that's the Local Partnership Program, and that provides uh, $200 million per year, and the Solutions for Congested Quarters Program provides $250 million per year to successful applicants. Next slide. So, um, after uh, the Senate Bill 1 passed, uh, RTC was concurrently working on um, a, uh, a feasibility study. Actually, um, on June 26, 
2018, the Monterey Salinas Transit and the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District completed a project report and feasibility study on bus on shoulder operations for State Route 1 and the Monterey Branch Line identified a hybrid lane bus on shoulder project on State Route 1 between Morrissey Boulevard and Freedom Boulevard interchanges as a sustainable and cost-effective way to provide meaningful benefits to transit riders in the corridor. Next slide. Meanwhile, um, RTC was working on uh, trying to identify all the um, investments um, that um, the county kind of wanted to do regionally. And um, on January 17th um, of 2019, the RTC adopted a unified corridor investment study, which identified a preferred scenario of improvements on three east-west corridors, including the highway. Next slide. The preferred scenario from the UCIS included integrating bus on shoulders with the construction of auxiliary lanes with a strategy to use, utilize Measure D funds as matching funds to compete for and secure state and federal competitive grants for the hybrid auxiliary lane bus on shoulder project. Next slide. So uh, RTC worked with um, um, the CHP and uh, Caltrans and uh, Santa Cruz Metro and um, on May 23rd, 2019, it completed a report for the State Route 1 Auxiliary Lane Bus on Shoulder concept of operation, which represents a hybrid auxiliary lane bus on shoulder facility extending from Monterey Boulevard to Freedom Boulevard. And uh, uh, Caltrans and the Highway Patrol both supported this project um, and um, this fulfills a key requirement of the legislation which allows bus on shoulders. And as you can see in this slide in this picture, it kind of explains what, what we would be doing. We'd be building auxiliary lanes between the interchanges where the ramps come on. The, the blue um, uh, colored area is an auxiliary lane. Um, it shows it extending from an on-ramp to an off-ramp. And then uh, the bus would be allowed to travel in the yellow area, which would actually be the shoulder that goes underneath uh, one of the overcrossings. And here we show one going under 41st Avenue. Next slide. So uh, the Measure D um, expenditure plan, this is an actual excerpt from it, and it shows that the auxiliary lanes um, are included in the expenditure plan. And um, they actually spelled out three specific ones. 41st Avenue to SoCal Drive, Bay Porter to um, uh, Park Avenue, and State Park to Park Avenue. It also mentions uh, bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings, and then you see down there at the bottom, the Highway Safety and Congestion Reduction Program. So when I first looked at this, I saw auxiliary lanes included, and I also saw that, um, that uh, programs that reduce uh, improved safety and, and congestion reduction was also included. So um, I was working with the commission and trying to see if we can um, expand the program. So um, we, I brought an item to um, put out an RFP to um, um, put out an additional set, two sets of auxiliary lanes, um, and, um, and they um, directed me to move forward. However, I received a comment that um, we specifically didn't include those two additional auxiliary lanes in the Measure D um, expenditure plan, and they requested that we actually amend the expenditure plan to be able to move forward with those two additional um, auxiliary lanes. Next slide. So the ordinance does allow the Measure D expenditure plan to be amended to provide for the use of additional federal, state, and local revenues to account for unexpected revenues and to take into consideration unforeseen circumstances. Um, if we are to amend it, it has to be initiated by the authority, reciting findings and necessity. We need to provide notice after that has been done to the Board of Supervisors and City Council, which I did immediately after um, the record of necessity findings um, were made by the um, commission. And then um, that uh, amendment becomes effective 45 days after the notice was, was given and that became effective on March 23rd. Next slide. 
So this is actually uh, an excerpt of the amendment. You see it's a pretty minor amount of uh, language that was added. We just added the two sets of auxiliary lanes, and we actually decided that it would be prudent to add bus on shoulders to specifically called out as a highway safety and congestion reduction program. Next slide. So this is a summary of what we're trying to do here on Highway 1. Um, we're doing it in phases. Um, if you look over to the right side, you'll see Highway 17. Um, the green, the first set of green uh, lines you see are the existing auxiliary lanes between Morsi Boulevard and Soquel Avenue. Um, you see there in Fuchsia would be the bus on shoulders going underneath the Soquel Avenue overcrossing. Then you'll see a new set of auxiliary lanes from Soquel to 41st Avenue. And then um, the bus on shoulders would continue from there. That 2.75 mile phase one um, is uh, well underway. A um, portion of it has already been built as, as previously explained. Um, the, the section from Soquel Avenue to 41st Avenue, we're in final design right now. And we're working on our application for solutions to congested corridor program funding. Phase two, it would be three miles long and would include two additional sets of auxiliary lanes from Porter to um, Park and from Park to State Park. That project is currently in the environmental stage, stage and will be advancing to design soon thereafter. That project also is going to be included in our application um, that we're going to submit in either June or July, depending on when the CTC decides our applications are due. Um, we hope to have funding for those for phase one and phase two um, uh, applied for um, 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 by that deadline. And if uh, we're successful, um, phase one could be under construction in 2021. Phase two could be in construction in 2023, 2024. And then um, the new sets of auxiliary lanes that were added by the amendment from State Park to Rio Del Mar and from Rio Del Mar to Freedom Avenue. We have already hired a consultant and they're starting the, uh, the uh, environmental phase right now. And in two years, there'll be a next, another round of funding and we hope to apply for uh, funding for that round. And that would complete the bus on shoulder corridor from Morsi Boulevard to Freedom Boulevard. And that concludes my report, and I'd certainly be uh, willing to answer any questions that uh, council members of the public might have. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go down the line with the council members here. Uh, council Member Bator, if any questions? I have no questions. Uh, thank you for that report, Guy. Council Member Bertrand, any questions? Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, Guy, Executive uh, Director Guy, would you uh, give a little more description of what the bus on shoulder program does and how that will uh, help us in the uh, high commute times? And also talk a little bit about how this whole overall program in the three stages uh, should um, increase the efficiency of the highway corridor. So the, uh, the problem, we've been supporting transit in this county since the 1970s. We had a hot, the county, passed a um, half-cent sales tax for, that's dedicated to Santa Cruz Metro um, in the 70s. And um, we have a pretty good bus system. The problem is our buses get stuck in the same traffic that single occupancy vehicles get stuck in on the highway. Um, so, um, you know, there's only so much room on the highway. There's only so much money to be done. And, um, you know, that, that we have to, to complete our project. So we're trying to convince people to get out of their cars and ride the bus instead of um, using their, their, their vehicles by themselves. And we believe that that would be a good way to reduce congestion on the highway system. Um, the best advertisement for the bus would be to see the bus moving by all the cars sitting and idling in traffic. But we also do think that the auxiliary lanes do relieve traffic as well. Um, if you have driven on Highway 1 uh, pre-COVID-19, um, it's pretty much a standstill, um, except in the area where the auxiliary lanes were already constructed. It moves pretty well there. So we do think it's going to provide some relief to, to the average um, traveler. But over time, you know, 
once you provide a certain amount of relief, it, it starts to fill up. So the, the buses would be a, allowed to drive in the auxiliary line. They'd be allowed to go across the gore points and underneath the overcross and, and, and bypass all that traffic. And uh, we believe that by doing so, that will increase um, uh, transit usage and that would also release, reduce congestion on, on the highway system. So um, by each phase of the project, um, as we build each phase, we're going to um, um, provide some congestion relief, relief and provide an opportunity for the buses to use um, the auxiliary lanes and the shoulders to bypass the traffic. Um, we can't build it all at once because um, we don't be able to apply for this funding and get it the funding in place. We must, must have environmental clearance. So we will um, we'll apply for it in phases and move forward as we can until we can complete the system. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. If not, let me know and I'll uh, see if I can uh, provide any more details. No, I, I, no, it does. And I, I think it gives a pretty good idea of how the buses with the addition of the auxiliary lane and the bus on shoulder is going to help considerably. And I like your comment about the advertisement. And, and you know, one of the things that's really important about applying for this funding is to propose the sorts of projects that the uh, California Transportation Commission is looking for. And um, the CTC is, is very much interested in seeing multimodal projects, projects that um, in include um, uh, more than one mode of transportation. So our project would reduce congestion for single occupancy vehicles and trucks driving on Highway 1. But it also has a transit component, and it also has um, the bicycle pet overcrossings included in them as well. We have one at Chance Clear Avenue. We have one at Mar Vista. Um, we're also um, going to be replacing the bridge at uh, Capitola Avenue, and the new uh, bridge at Capitola Avenue and the, the city of Capitola will um, have bicycle lanes on it. Um, so we find it to be very attractive. Um, the, the new project that we added from uh, uh, um, State Park to Rio Del Mar includes the two railroad bridges, and those are going to be replaced with uh, longer bridges to accommodate the auxiliary lane. Um, that'll provide shoulders in those locations where there currently are not no shoulders. So um, that's going to improve safety and um, allow emergency vehicles a place to go if we're ever in an emergency that's uh, different than this one where we're asked to stay home, one that requires us to evacuate, we will actually have additional width on the highway system for this huge safety component in it as well. Um, we're looking for innovative projects and projects that um, that kind of think outside the box. And um, every single meeting that I've gone to statewide and talked about this project, um, it's been extremely popular. Uh, Santa Cruz and Monterey County are the only two counties in the state that have legislation that allow buses to ride on the shoulder. So we're going to be very unique in our application, and we think um, based on those factors, we have a very good chance of being successful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Council Member Story, any questions? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, and Guy, thank you for coming on and giving us this report, and particularly the visuals um, on the relationship between the bus on shoulders and the auxiliary lane. Um, and it, it appears that the bus on shoulder is a continuation of the auxiliary lane. Um, and, I, and my question is, I mean, if you could confirm that the bus on shoulder is exclusively for buses only, but I know that the auxiliary lanes are not. And so I wonder what is going to be the enforcement mechanism? Is this like signage and, and, and fines uh, for cars that may um, travel on the uh, shoulder? Um, so I was just curious about that. Yeah, we've been working very closely with the CHP um, and Santa Cruz Metro. Um, we are going to have significant signage out there that shows that buses are only permitted on the shoulders. And the shoulders that they're using are only um, under the existing overcrossing. Um, they will be using the auxiliary lanes um, alongside or with the, the vehicles that will also be allowed to use the auxiliary lanes. So you pretty much um, answered your question um, um, with your statement that um, you know, is it going to be fines and 
and enforcement by CHP, yes, that's exactly how it's going to be done. Um, we don't really think that there's going to be too much abuse. Um, I think it would be pretty obvious um, that only a bus is allowed. You know, I know that there's abuse with HOV lanes. Um, those are the high occupancy vehicle lanes that you see. But, um, you know, it's very hard to tell what those high occupancy vehicles, if there's a small kid in the back or if there's, um, you know, if they have an exception to ride in, in the HOV lane based on them being an electric vehicle. But um, when you're riding under the overcrossings, only buses are going to be permitted. And uh, we do think that um, most of the public would comply. And if they don't, uh, CHP is looking um, towards enforcing. And we are looking to provide um, paid barriers for the CHP to um, um, park in and so that they could uh, be very visible and enforce the, the, uh, the requirements. Um, of the law, which would not allow the vehicles to ride underneath the overcrossing on the shoulders. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks, any questions? I have none. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, with that, we will bring it to uh, public comment. Have we received any uh, emails from the public on this item? And refreshing it looks like we did not seeing none all right we will close public comment for this item and this was just an informational report so there's no additional action correct that's correct all right thank you so much uh, guy preston executive director of the regional transportation commission we really appreciate you uh, providing that update for us this evening you're very welcome anytime just let me know wonderful thanks again take care we're going to move on to item 7C, the final item of uh, tonight's agenda. Consider allocate, allocating 10000 of emergency grant funding to help address the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will go for a staff report. All right, <clears throat> council members, mayor. This item is on the agenda, on the, agenda at the request of uh, Mayor Peterson, who suggested that we could get an item to talk about utilizing the $10,000 of emergency grant funds that were set aside to help in the event that some need arose in our community. Uh, I think it was insightful to put the set funding aside. I think just none of us could anticipate how great the need was gonna be when that need did arise. Um, so we've identified some potential uses for the grant funds. This first one <clears throat> building off what Count, uh, Mayor Peterson mentioned at the last meeting is to help offset the cost for personal protective equipment that the city has been incurring. Um, really for the police department, public works, other employees. We're looking at some decontamination equipment that would be utilized by uh, officers as they went back into the station after their shift. Um, we estimate that about $5,000 is sort of our total spend at this point on PPE, extra um, cleaning equipment that we've been using to date. Another idea is about, um, I mentioned earlier, the online recreation classes. We're trying to buy down the, the, the cost, if you will, to help community become engaged in this new recreation offer offering, as well as um, you know keep the recreation department moving and active through this shelter in place order. And and so one suggestion would be that for the 85 class participants, we've been waiving the $18 registration fee. Um, we could use that to sort of help supplement that account um, to help buy down the cost for the community as well as um, sort of help the recreation department pilot another lower cost option. A couple other ideas, we've been looking at a website update. We're actually due for one. Um, the downside, so the, the website obviously is much more important than it was before, given the fact that City Hall isn't accessible and so many other so many people are now accessing information from the city on the web. Um, the problem, of course, is, is that we, we can't get it done in three weeks, two weeks. So this is m you know, more of a longer term project, um, but I thought I'd put it in the mix. And we have some information about what that might look like if you're interested. Um, and we estimate that at about $4,000 to complete the website upgrade. We've also, um, we could install some public sanitation uh, devices, maybe at McGregor, Esplanade, Jade Street Parks. Um, that sort of be public hand washing stations. Um, the cost isn't too significant. Each one is about $120 a month plus a $30 setup fee. Obviously, we couldn't put them in the parks until the parks became open, but that is uh, a fourth option to use the grant funds. And then the fifth option, um, 
Mayor Peterson brought this up, I think, when she mentioned this item in our last meeting, was that the Community Foundation has established the COVID-19 Local Response Fund. The funds are used to support organizations in their response throughout the county. As of the end of last month, they granted over $500,000 out of this fund, and the first fund priority is for organizations that are on the front lines of the COVID-19 response. And so with that, um, a recommendation is, is the council to identify some uses for the $10,000 of emergency grant funds, and I'm available for questions. All right, uh, council member Bautorf, any questions? I have no questions, thank you. Thank you, council member Bertrand, questions? Right, so uh, how, how, how fast do we act on the improvement of the website? And um, I agree with you, this is a long-term benefit to the city. Um, can you give me a, uh, expand a little bit about what um, we'd be working on? So I'm gonna turn to the clerk who's been spearheading this effort. So the question was, is, is could we fast track the website update? Um, and are there any options to, to get that down or is the three to four months really the minimum you think it would be necessary? From discussions, um, can you can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. So from discussions I've had with um, our staff and with our representative from our website um, manager, the three months is, is a short period of time compared to what they have discussed. Um, so that would be the soonest I think we could get a really, really nice product for the community up and, and ready. answer your question council member Bertrand well I'm sort of wondering what the enhancements are and and the features that would be of benefit to the city of Capitola and the residents absolutely so um so, so would you like a little bit we do have a few slides to show what they would look look like is that would that be helpful to take a look at yeah yeah that'd be great I'm just trying to envision if, if this is the choice of the council what we'd be spending our money on thank you Okay, so thank you, um, council and mayor. I think we're all aware that our website is a little old. It could be revamped. This has been something we've discussed for a while, but like our city manager said, um, city hall is closed. Most people are getting information they need from our website, so it's very important that that information is clear, easy to access, a, a, a significant thing is that it should be mobile friendly so that those can access our information on their phones, not just on a laptop or personal computer. And something that's close to my heart is that our social media accounts could be better integrated into our website. So at this point, I hate to say that our website is a little confusing. It's text heavy. There's a lot of information, which is wonderful, but it's a little hard to navigate. So I have some examples here um, there's too much text happening. If you click through, that'll become more apparent. And yes, there's, I believe there's too many steps. For example, to get to our Instagram page from our website, there's not one, not two, not even three, but four clicks where there could be one. So what we do want, as I said, is clear information that's concise. Um, I feel it's important for that to make sense to people that don't work for the city or aren't super familiar with the way we run public meetings, for example. So how can we use keywords and logical explanations so that you know anyone can really get the information they need? And it should be pretty. So here's an example. This is a revamped website, that exact same fee that we would pay the 4,000 um, that the city of Los Altos had gone through with the same provider that we use. As you can see, there's a very clear, obvious bar there at the top that has COVID-19 information. If you, click, if you were to click on that, the next slide shows a very nice, this is a little small just for our screen, but a clear page with, with links that are embedded in the first page, not hidden at the bottom as our website is now um, for all different information 
takes you to, to the appropriate resources based on the current emergency. So, what, the yeah. What do we want to? That sure. would be yeah. That's the example I have ready. Um, off the top of my head, I have a few more cities that have gone through the same process, but I think we can agree this is a good thing to do, just maybe not right now. That's, of course, up to, to you. Thank you. Um, let me see, who was that? Council member Story? Or who was, I, who was asking that question? Council Bertrand, Bertrand, thank you. <laughs> uh, did that answer your question, Council member Bertrand? Yeah, I think that gives me a good idea. I'm, Obviously, I've had some issues with our website, so I'm glad the city's addressing this. Great, thank you. Council Member Story, any questions? Yes, can you hear me? I've, yes, we can I've hear had you. a little technical difficulty, but um, I had a question about the hand washing stations. Um, and I just, um, are the bathrooms at the Esplanade and J Street Park? Uh, uh, have they or will they be open? Um, will the hand washing stations be in the bathrooms or outside of the bathrooms? And are the bathrooms available for hand washing? Steve, are you online? Do you want to answer that? I'll take a stab at the answer. So, in general, the bathrooms are available for hand washing. Obviously, they're not accessible now, so they are closed. We talked about potentially getting these hand washing stations, you know, maybe at locations that were a little bit removed, a little bit further distance from the restrooms. That was certainly a conversation we had internally was how much of a need was there at Jade Street and the Esplanade, given that there are already restrooms. But we think we think that potentially getting them a little bit further away from the restrooms, even when they're open, um, would provide some benefit. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks, any questions? I have none, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I thought I had a question, but maybe I don't. So um, we will bring this to public comment. Did we receive any emailed public comments on this item? Click the wrong thing. Do a quick send and receive to make sure. It's interesting, the Planning Commission got, I think, three or four public comments. Wow. But, you know, they must have uh, hot topics on their agenda. I guess so. No, it doesn't look like we got any public comments. All right. Uh, seeing none, we'll close public comment for this item, bring it back to Council for a discussion and a vote. Uh, we'll start down at the other end, or who would be at the other end of the table tonight. Uh, let's start with Council Member Story. Do you have any additional comments? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Yes, I just wanted to express um, you know, coming out of this um, pandemic, um, I think that we're going to have some significant fiscal issues before us. Um, and I think I would, would have us rather wait um, on how we uh, expend money until we see uh, what those fiscal issues are going to be, the depth of them, uh, and what all the needs will be before us. Uh, at that time. Um, with that said, I think it would be appropriate to spend the $5,000 for the PPE um, because I assume that's probably uh, supplanting general fund money um, uh, that we uh, would be using. Um, and um, and also the hand washing station, um, that, that's, a, that's kind of a minor expense. Um, so I think I'd, I mean, I'd leave that to staff whether they felt that that was uh, a needed service that we needed to provide. Um, but in view that, you know, we have the bathrooms at Jade Street uh, and at the Esplanade, um, and if we just made sure that um, they were stocked with the necessary soap um, um, and drying um, paper towels or the, or the drying machine, um, and, uh, but at, you know, McGregor, when that opens up again, um, I don't know that we have anything um, there suitable. So that may be appropriate. That's a smaller amount. Um, but 
you know, I think that I would like to see us uh, hold off on um, any of the uh, other expenditures, um, and, and that's not an expression about their worthiness. I think they're all very worthy, and at some point uh, we need to address them. Uh, but I think at this time, I think that we need to look toward addressing uh, some significant fiscal issues that may be confronting us. Uh, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Story. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Peterson, for bringing this um, forward to the attention of for the, uh, to the rest of Council. Um, I would agree for the most part with Council Member Story. Um, I think that there that it is hard to weigh out what um, what our actual financial needs will be when we come out of the shelter in place and even further down the road. I think that the funds could be utilized for directly for um, for the PPE, the five thousand there, and then be released to the rest uh, to uh, the general fund for at the discretion of staff to decide where to supplant the the rest of it um, afterwards. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, um, I think Sam is actually correct that we will have uh, financial issues coming up. But um, the immediate issue right now is personal protection. And I think the last meeting I talked about that, especially for our police department. So in general, I think we should provide that protection. We may not need 5,000. I would support um, a measure that said, you know, as, as we need it, um, I don't want to be short of money for that particular concern. Um, maybe we could put signs up to remind people that there's bathrooms and they could definitely go into the bathroom at J Street Park or at uh, the Esplanade and, and wash your hands there. Um, the other reason why I think um, we should expand on the website is, as Sam brought up earlier, uh, we're going to have to do a lot of work, I think, if we engage with our community, especially if we make that effort to prepare uh, City of Capitola for all the developments that are going to be unfolding as we get out of this crisis. Um, it's probably going to be quite extensive, the different things that the public will want to know about. So from that perspective, I think we should have a website that is very easy for people to use. Um, the people in this town are going to look to us to help be a main source for that kind of information. And I think this website development would be very critical in that regard. So I would support the 4,000 for that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bautorf. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Uh, b before I weigh in on how I think this money should be distributed, I want to go back a little bit because uh, this is kind of a, a fund that's near and dear to me. If uh, I, I think this fund, I, Mayor Peterson, you and I got together, I think it was about three years ago, and, and came up with this $10,000 as a uh, fund for something we had no idea what we were putting the money aside for. And as this uh, city manager alluded to when we first started, it's great that we have this money available to us for something that we planned for but had no idea it was coming. And I think this is exactly what we were talking about three years ago when we set this money aside for, for something that we couldn't predict but rather than have to, like right now, we all know that because of sales tax and other issues with the city, our dollars are going to be tight. But this is money that was set aside just for this purpose. And I remember at the time that we took a little bit of abuse for, for setting aside money that wasn't dedicated for any fund. And I think it's a great luxury that we have this money now to use it because the ideas that have come up, I think, are, are, are justified at this time. I totally support the, uh, the $5,000 uh, for the police department, for PPE, I think that uh, the, the risk that they're assuming right now is beyond measure. So uh, if that's what they need, that's what they should get. Uh, I am disturbed by our website. Uh, this is how, as we, as we sit at home, as the public sits at home, as they try to reach out and find out what they can, this is where they need to go. And the fact that I think, uh, I think uh, Chloe brought, put it very... Uh, delicately when she said that our that our website is woefully uh, shortcoming so 
Uh, I think that as we move forward and the public's going to go to us, it should be very easy for them to find what they need. So uh, I, I think that this probably would be a good use of the funds. Uh, and the, the money for the hand washing, we can't keep people staying at home all the time. They want to get out. We're telling them to, you know, social distance. We're telling them to wash their hands. I think that personally, I feel that our parks are woefully inadequate for what we provide. We have parks that don't have bathrooms, don't have a place to wash your hands. So in this case, places like uh, McGregor and Jade Street and uh, the Esplanade where the hand washing would come in, I think all three of these are a good use of money. Uh, I would, uh, you know, I, the, the, the amounts were recommended, I think, are, uh, you know, they, they could be uh, adjusted. I, I, I mentioned to the mayor that I said, you know, I think this is a great idea that you brought this forward. Uh, however you wanted to allocate the funds, I would support that. So I'm not going to uh, nail down any final allocations of funds right now, but I do believe that all three of the ideas that were mentioned were good. And if there happened to be any money left over to go back into the city general fund, that would be fine, too. So I, I will support this measure uh, with ever the, uh, whatever the allocation that the mayor recommends is what uh, I tend to be leaning towards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so it sounds like uh, I would agree, and it sounds like all the four of us, uh, all the rest of the council members would also agree uh, that we feel that the personal protective equipment is uh, first and foremost uh, one of the important things for us to spend these funds on to ensure that our first responders, uh, our police, our fire, um, are, are safe as they're out continuing to do their essential services and, and keeping the rest of our community um, safe and protected. Um, so that's, that's my first comment is I think the PPE would be the most essential. Um, I'm, I'm split uh, on the remainder. I agree that we're probably gonna be facing some financial difficulties when we come out of this and we're gonna need to um, consider how much of this emergency fund we might want to save until that time. Um, but I also agree that our website is incredibly important since that's essentially the front door of the city right now. Um, that the hand washing stations are uh, vital um, once our parks reopen and, and we have more people out in the community to have those kind of sanitation stations would be uh, very important. Um, and I'm also intrigued by the um, the virtual recreation that it was for a virtual recreation correct yeah um because for as long as this shelter in place stays in order i think if we're asking people to stay in their homes as much as we can do to encourage them to do that um and provide them some kind of recreation that's beneficial to uh, mental health during this time i think would also be very important um so i i guess i'll i'll uh, open it up for further discussion and a motion, but I, I think that we can all agree that the, the PPE, the personal protective equipment, um, is, is first and foremost one of the most important things we spend these funds on. If I may, um, Mayor Peterson, uh, go first with some comments. Yes, please. Sure, um, thank you. I So hearing the feedback from the rest of council, I'm not sure how realistic this would be and um, maybe our city uh, our manager can help with maybe um, setting the priority, saying that the PPE is our first priority, then the website. For me personally, if it were to come down to the hand washing stations or the recreation department and supporting them after the shelter in place, I fully believe that we're, or during the shelter in place with our beaches being closed, I really feel it's important that we support our community members in other ways possible. And I think offering um, discounted recreational opportunities via virtual platforms is, is important. So for me, if we were to release these funds um, for the emergency, uh, these emergency funds, and thank you council member Plator for reminding us what they're supposed to be, what it's supposed to be used for. I would say that my priority would be to to spend them first with the PPE, then the website, then the recreation, and if there were enough left, then to look into the hand washing station. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Peterson, I'm prepared to make a motion if uh, if you're ready for that. Sure, go ahead. 
Um, just one quick question for the city manager. If you could just uh, give me again the numbers for the uh, recreational program and the, uh, the bathrooms. So the sanitation stations are 120 bucks a month with a $30 setup fee. So if we just put one in McGregor, if, you know, it'd be 150 bucks for the first month to 70, I want to say, after two months. Um, the other question was about, can you see my screen right now? The recreation The other program. question was about the uh, recreational fees. Right, so the recreation program. So the recreation program right now, I mean, we, we in, in order to help drive recreation, we were rolling this thing out pretty quickly, this online rec class. So the city, in fact, actually waived that $18 registration fee for the 85 residents who signed up for the class. So, you know, in a sense, this is something we've already done. Um, this was really intended to help, help people during the shelter in place, as the council members have noted as well as make it affordable and um, get people other activities. So the cost of waiving that for those 85 class registrants so far is $1,500. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll go ahead with the motion. Uh, my motion is to uh, uh, allocate or utilize the grant fund money for the amount of $10,000 to be distributed in the following fashion. $4,500 for PP&E, $3,500 for the website, $1,530 for uh, educational, um, the uh, recreational program, and $470 for uh, bathrooms at uh, necessary parks. I'll second that. All right. All right, uh, so we have a motion and a second, so I'll go to the two that weren't part of the motion or the second. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, any additional comments? Uh, on that motion or on the item? I have none, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, council member story. Council member story, do you have any? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm here, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having a little technical difficulty, but uh, um, well, I have a little difficulty spending $3,500 on the website at this time. It won't be up and running for three or four months. Um, I think that we should be keeping our attention on the, you know, the impact of uh, this uh, of the current emergency. Um, I would just limit it. I mean, the the request for the PPE was actually $5,000, both for the police, public works, and for employees. Um, I think that that should be fully funded. Uh, at this time. Um, so that's what I would prefer that uh, we would have focused on those things um, and spreading it around in this fashion and not knowing what we're going to be confronted with even before uh, these emergency orders are terminated. Uh, this all seems rather, feels premature to me. Um, and so for that, um, I'm not going to support the motion as it's stated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, any additional comments? No, I, you know, I, I like the idea of what the vice mayor said in terms of the prioritization, which I thought was the way to focus our comments. And I agree definitely that PP is um, protecting our employees, especially police and anyone in direct contact with the public, like public works, um, primary. Um, I agree with Sam that the um, website um, won't be out very quickly, but I think by the time we get this done, we will be in the midst of trying to engage with the public and making sure that they engage with um, the city and trying to move forward. We have so much to do, get our commercial sector going, um, getting the regular activities of our village going. I think the website will be very critical at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. City Manager. Uh, Mayor, Council, the one point that we didn't make during the presentation as we were talking about the website is if we do include funding to the website upgrade, <clears throat> we think that potentially having a council member assigned to a subcommittee that could help kind of guide the process could be valuable. Not necessary, but certainly could be helpful. So you may want to consider that as part of the motion if 
if we do decide to include the website at this time. Okay. I think it's um, Mayor Peter. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. No, I was just gonna. Um, if uh, Councilmember Bodtorf wanted to amend his motion, I would be more than happy to join that committee. Uh, Councilmember Bottorf, do you accept that as a, a friendly amendment to your motion to um, recommend uh, Vice Mayor Brooks to work with staff on the website? Did we lose him? Yeah. And I think your microphone might be I'll muted. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> 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 and I will agree with the, uh, as a second, I'll agree with it. Okay, so we have the person who seconded the motion agreeing with it. We're just waiting for uh, Council Member Bottorf. Can you hear us? It looks like. We might have lost him. We might have lost him. Can this be a mayor's committee? It's connecting. If you give him one second, I can say it's connecting. Okay. Okay. Is that something w that would need to be part of the motion or that could that be decided um, offline? Um, it could be decided offline. The council could simply say that the mayor has the authority to appoint somebody to a committee. Okay. That, that works for me. Do I need, do I need like council consensus that I as mayor can appoint someone to that committee or how would we move forward with this? Given that we're having the discussion at a meeting, I think it probably would be appropriate. The challenge here is it looks like we've lost Council Member Bottorf. So, okay. um, should we take So, if that's true, and if someone would just like to make another motion, if you make, if someone makes another motion, it'll be voted on first. Oh, okay. So, that was and our. If it obviously the need for the first one, then I think we've solved the problem. Great. Sure. I'll make a motion um, similarly to Councilmember Bottorf for note's sake. I think Chloe has those. Um, the addition I would add is to ensure that um, the recreation, uh, the recreation and the hand washing stuff is for the extent of the shelter in place. I don't know if that needed to be said, but I just want to make sure that's noted um, and that. I would be um, more than happy to to assist in the website editing. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, second by Council Member Bertrand. Okay. Um, how many bathrooms or hand washing stations will that four hundred and seventy dollars get us? Just one, right? I think that gets us. Um, Isn't it? Is it a hundred and a hundred and twenty dollars for each station plus the thirty dollars setup? Yeah. So that would be three for. Oh one no! Month. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. I'm looking at the wrong math. You're right. So three for one month. For one month. Okay. Hmm. Mayor Peterson, do you want me? Do you are you thinking that we should amend it if it's just three for one month versus me saying the extent of the shelter in place is well, that your concern the only yeah my only concern is if we stay for the extent of the shelter in place we need to have the funding to be able to continue it and right now it's about it would be about four hundred dollars a month for three bath three sanitation stations to be set up i hear you yeah yeah i agree um so i would just strike that from my motion and if either council that member mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, I was going to say either that or if we wanted to get three bathrooms for, I don't know, three months, um, we would essentially need to take that funding from somewhere else, possibly like reimbursements from the, from the rec. Uh, yeah, that's not what I would do. I would just give or leave it to the discretion of staff to utilize the dollars to the extent of what we have. Okay, so what I'm hearing is is it was thirty five hundred for the website, fifteen hundred dollars to help out with rec, and then I think the remainder, although I don't think there is any remainder with thirty five hundred dollars plus fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, in the PPE, 
Yeah, I have 4,500 for PPE, 3,500 for the web with Yvette serving as a council liaison. <coughs> Correct. Uh, $1,500 for the rec department, and it leaves, or 1530 for the rec department, and that leaves about $470 for bathrooms. So that's about one month, or, or sanitation stations, not bathrooms, excuse me. That's about one month uh, with three locations. For the three locations? For the three locations, yeah. Um, I mean, as a recommendation, I think, you know, the, the recreation. This is Councilman Botter. Can you hear me? Hey, yes. Welcome back. You're back. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I, I just want, before you get too far down the road, I, I guess, not sure if the other motion is already on board, but it sounds like it's consistent with which what I had, which is fine. Yes. And, and there's a challenge here. There's only $10,000. And, you know, I, I think it's just we give the guidelines on the motion for the amount and the, the city manager adjusts it as needed. You know, maybe you don't need all the money for PP. Maybe you need it for the bathrooms. But I think there's enough of a guideline to get some essential things with all that we have. Yeah. That's I just my, 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 my two cents. I agree. Um, uh, so, uh, Council Member Bautorf, when, when you were off the line, Council Member Brooks uh, made an additional motion that was almost exactly the same as yours, but we did that because um, we weren't sure if we'd get you back. And so now Council Member Brooks's motion will be voted on first. Um, Councilwoman I would Bro like to withdraw my motion if I can. Oh, you're going to withdraw it? Yeah, so then okay. um, Council Member Bautorf can finish. Thank you. Okay. So, Councilwoman Brooks, and, I, and I'm okay with the friendly amendment for Councilman Brooks or for Vice Mayor Brooks to be on that committee. Okay. So, Councilmember Bro uh, Vice Mayor Brooks has withdrawn her motion. We're back to uh, Councilmember Botorf's motion with uh, the amendment that Yvette be added to the committee. Would would there be um, oh, a willingness, uh, Councilmember Botorf and Councilmember Bertrand, who seconded it? Um, for the interest of ensuring that all of our needs are met to say that, that we as a council are um, agreeing to expend this $10,000 and we recommend that it be spent in this manner as Council Member Bautorf laid out. And that way, if there's any need for the city manager to rearrange some of these funds accordingly um, to ensure that all the city's needs are met, that, that they would have the ability to do so. Does, would that seem appropriate? Uh, if that's an amendment, that's a friendly amendment, I think that's a good guideline to give to, to give the city manager. Okay. I, I agree with the guideline. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does the city clerk have the motion? Is, I know it got a little complicated yes. for a you. second there. Okay. Um, I'll just give a, a period of, of silence for just a second here to see is there any additional council comment on this issue? Hearing none, we have a motion in a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. Thank you for all your patience. Councilmember Story. No. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Uh, motion carries uh, four to one. Uh, that brings us to the end of a night's, uh, tonight's agenda. Thank you so much for all the council members and all the staff that joined us tonight uh, via the Zoom meeting. Thank you to the staff that's here in the room practicing social distancing and wearing our face coverings as is recommended now uh, for health and safety of others uh, and of ourselves. Um, thank you to our police and our fire and all our first responders and everyone on the, the front line. Please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Uh, be safe and be well. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.